All right, everybody, let's get the lecture going for this afternoon. Very good to see everybody here today. Everybody uh, looks ready for some physics. So the plan for this week, um, we're going to be building on some of the concepts we were looking on last week. So last week we were looking about thermal physics and heat energy. And the next crucial concept to go from there is really thinking about pressure and these related concepts of stress and strain. Now, all three of these, they have a bit more in common with, you know, work and energy like we saw a few weeks ago, right? Because these are all three concepts that, again, we use in kind of everyday language, right? So you might say, oh, I'm really stressed today. Maybe you're under a lot of pressure. Maybe you're feeling the strain. But of course, in physics, they all have very uh, specific meaning. So we're going to be finding out what these concepts are, how they relate to uh, work and energy that we've seen previously. Now, has anybody studied pressure before? Is anyone on pressure before? Okay, some people, okay, okay, fine. And has anyone done stress and strain before? Right. Okay, so it's basically, basically the same people. Okay, so if you have done uh, stress and strain and pressure before, hopefully we're going to have some interesting angles on these concepts in this lecture and next time that maybe you haven't seen before. If this is the first time that you're seeing either of these concepts, that's absolutely fine. That's the idea. Um, you know, we're not going to assume anything. We're just going to be building on what we've seen previously. Before we dive right into the new concepts, I just wanted to say it's so fantastic to see everybody working really well at the Friday afternoon workshops. It's just great to see people working together, helping each other out, trying the challenge questions, working through uh, the textbook questions. Uh, it really is great to see that. That really is how science is done collaboratively, helping each other out, working hard, figuring things out, okay? So it's, it's really good to see that um, every week, okay? Um, so I hope the people who are trying to challenge questions, hope you're finding them interesting. Um, hope they might help a bit uh, with the course. One thing related to that that I just wanted to mention, so I had some really great discussions with some of you guys, well, you guys about um, sort of problem solving with units and what to do if you can't remember the equation we're going to use. It, was it you guys? Yeah, yeah, you guys. So um, it was it's such a great chat and it, it was... Um, such important points. Um, and I just thought I'd like to start this lecture just by putting some of those points up on a slide. Um, so this serves as a bit of a recap for some of the heat energy stuff we did last week, um, but also some kind of general approaches to problem solving, some things which are going to be really important, especially as we're getting towards, you know, we're kind of more than halfway through the semester. Maybe we're starting to think a little bit about the exam. So some approaches that are really going to be helpful um, with that, okay. So the situation we're in in Friday, so we had a question, but we couldn't remember what the equation was going to be to solve the question, okay. So this is a really good opportunity to think about what to do in this situation. Maybe you're in an exam and there's a question and you can kind of remember some things, but you don't know the exact equation that you're going to need to solve it. So what can we do in this situation? And the key thing there is always to think about the units, okay? Now, I know I'm always, always going on about units, but it's because they're so important. So I'd just like to start with this one slide um, ab about how, how we can do this, okay? So let's suppose uh, we've got this question here. Maybe this could be, you know, an exam question or a workshop question, and we're thinking about the energy that we need to raise the temperature of a little bar of gold there. So we've got a bar of gold, we know the mass, the bar, it's just at ambient temperature. And we're thinking about how much energy do we need to raise the temperature of the bar of gold until it gets to its melting temperature. So we know the temperature we want to reach, so 1064 degrees Celsius. And we're also given the specific heat capacity of gold, so that 128 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. So I think this was kind of similar to the question we had on uh, Friday. Now you might say, you know, this isn't the most fantastically exciting physics problem in the world, but it's a, it's a good honest example of the kind of questions we might see in workshops, or you might see a question like this in the exam. So we're provided with some values here, but what would we do if we were in 
an exam and we didn't have the equation, we couldn't remember the equation, we might think we're a bit stuck, okay? So what I'd just like to do is detail a few points, a few approaches, which are always going to work for you and it's always going to help you out if you're in a situation like this. So the first thing I'd suggest, if you've got a question like this, even if you can remember the equation, but especially if you can't, is to start by writing down all of the variables that we're given. But don't just write them out. It's super important to write them out with the symbols, so the variables we use, and also with the units. So write them out with the symbols and the units. Now, I'm such a fanatic about units because, as we're going to see, they really help us to solve problems if we think we kind of don't know how to get started on them. But if we start by just writing things out, well, you can always do that, okay, even if you're not sure where to go after that. So let's start by writing down everything that we're given here. So, well, we know the specific heat capacity. That's something we're just given. So we write that down. We usually use a little C for that. And then the units here. So we're just given the units joules per kilogram per Kelvin. So that's a fine place to start. Then what else have we got? We've got the mass. So I've just quickly converted it from grams into kilograms. If you're not too sure about converting between, you know, grams and kilograms or meters and centimeters or anything like that, if you're not 100% sure about that, just write it down in grams and just take a couple of lines of working to do the conversion. If you're solid and you're kind of happy to just write it down like that, then that's okay. But if you're not 100% sure, just take the time and write it out uh, and show all the working there. So we've got the mass and then the last kind of thing we're given. So we know the initial temperature of our bar of gold and we know the final temperature that we want to get to. So from this, we can work out are delta T. Now again, if you're not 100% sure about working out your delta T, write it out step by step. Okay, so write your final temperature, your initial temperature, subtract them and see what you get. Okay, I'm just going to skip those for this slide here. If you're kind of solid with that in, in your working and you want to do that, that's okay, but always err on the side of writing things out. Okay, so finally we've got our delta T here. Now, this is a delta T in Kelvin, and you might say, well, hang on a minute. Kelvin, that's not the same as degrees Celsius. So does anyone have any ideas? Why is our delta T in Kelvin the same as our delta T in Celsius? Any thoughts? It's an increase in the same increments, so it's the same difference. Exactly right, okay. So great answer there. So Celsius and Kelvin, they're just shifted by a fixed amount. We're not changing the scale. So if we're looking at the difference between two Celsius points, that's going to be the same as the difference in Kelvin. So again, if you're not 100% sure and you want to just write out, I'm converting Celsius to Kelvin, Celsius to Kelvin, and the difference, please do that. Okay, don't uh, try and save any paper. Don't try and rush any steps. Okay, take all of the paper you need to do all your working. So this is kind of step one of a very general problem solving approach. And if you're ever in an exam or in a workshop and you have a question, you don't know how to solve it, this is always a great place to start because we've got all the symbols here that might help to get the memory thinking, help to solve the, get the problem solving parts of the brain going. We might think how to solve this problem. And crucially, we have all the units. There's one last bonus advantage to writing everything out from the question. Let me, uh, let me tell you what it is. So we've got, let's, just, let's suppose, let's think about the, uh, the specific heat capacity there. So we've got C equals, now it's given as 128, but suppose you just kind of misread it and you read it as 182. And then let's keep the units. So joules per kilogram Kelvin. So this could happen, right? Maybe you're in an exam, you just read something quickly and you write it down. You just get the numbers mixed up. Okay, so it can happen. If you write this out in the exam and you say, okay, I've read the specific heat capacity and you've written down that that's what you're using, you're going to get full credit, okay? You won't lose any marks if you've just misread a little number, 
got things back to front, okay? That's not a big deal because, you know, you've written it down and we know, okay, you've just misread some numbers. That's not a big deal. Whereas if you hadn't have written this down and you'd just done your calculation with the numbers back to front and got some energy at the end of it, it wouldn't be the correct energy that we're looking for, but we wouldn't be able to figure out what had gone wrong. So always take the time, write stuff out, okay? Now, obviously, you know, be careful. You don't want to be hasty, you don't want to make careless mistakes. But if you just make a small, reasonable mistake, just getting a couple of numbers back to front, that's really not a big deal. The one caveat I might make, if we're looking at, you know, we've got a mass of 10 to the minus three kilograms there, if you miswrote that as 10 to the plus three, then that's clearly quite a big difference there, okay? But just small numerical things, that's not a big deal. So we've got our, our values here, and this is kind of step one of solving the problem. Now you might say, well, where do we go from here if we don't know the equation? So the last thing to do is write down the thing you're looking for with the units. So we're looking for some heat energy. Does anyone remember what, what symbol do we use for heat energy? Can anyone remember that? Yeah? J. J. Ah, so J. So joules is going to be the units. So that's the units. Do not remember the symbol we use for heat energy? Sorry? Q. Yeah, it's Q. Very good. Very good. Okay. So those are the pieces we need. So we're going to calculate a heat energy. It's going to have units of joules. It's going to have a symbol of Q, but we don't know what the value is. So write that down as well. So our Q, it equals some amount of joules. Now, you might say, well, this is kind of a lot of work. We're just repeating what we're given in the question. But remember, so if you have read some of the numbers a little bit wrong, that's going to save you. But also, by the time we've written everything out with the symbols and the units, that might get the problem-solving part of your brain going. And maybe you might just remember, well, what the equation is. And even if you don't remember what the equation is, it's going to help you to figure out what the form of the equation has to be. So let's go and move on to the next step. Okay, so we've got our values and we're going to think, okay, well, how can we calculate what this Q is? So the secret is that based on the units, based on everything which is there, we can deduce what the equation has to be. There's one unique equation, there's one unique way that we can combine these three values to give us an energy. So if you're following along in your notes, you might want to have a think about, well, how can we combine these three to get an energy in joules. So let's start by looking at all the pieces of the puzzle we have here. We want to end up with a quantity which has some value in joules. The only quantity which we have here, which has joules in, is the heat capacity up here. So joules don't appear in the mass or the temperature. So we can start figuring out this situation, right? So we know that our heat capacity it's got to have that specific heat capacity in there. It's got to have the C for the heat capacity in there because that's the only way we're going to get those joules. And then we can just kind of solve this almost a bit like a kind of crossword or a Sudoku, something like that, if you guys do any of those. So let's look at the energy for our heat capacity, joules per kilogram per Kelvin. So we've got kilograms coming up next. So it's per kilograms. The only way we can get rid of that is by multiplying by the mass. So we know that it has to be C, oh, C times the mass. So we're nearly there. So we've got C times the mass. If we look at our C, it's per Kelvin. And the only thing we have up there with Kelvin in is our delta T. So we know also we're going to have to multiply by the delta T. So we know by looking at the units that our equation has to be Cm delta T. There's no other way to combine these three which will give us an energy, which is going to give us a value in joules. So we don't have to guess and we don't have to memorise. The secret is to look at the units. Once we've got this written out, we can also do a bit of a just a kind of um, quick check to see, does this all make sense? So if we look at the equation we have here, well, if we double our mass, we're going to need twice as much energy. If we double our delta T, 
we're going to need twice as much energy. So these are things that we would expect. We're not having anything wild going on as we're changing any of our values there. And we know it has to be like this. So if you're thinking, well, is it m c m delta t? Is it going to be you know squared, or do we have to divide by this, or you know take the square root of this? We know it can't be any of that stuff because then we won't get an answer in joules. We know it has to be that. So you can write that down with some confidence. Worst case scenario, we might be missing maybe a factor of, you know, a half or a two or a four pi or something out the front, but it's going to be close. And again, if you've written it down, then we know what equation you're using. And even if there is a small mistake with your equation, like you've missed a half or something, that's not such a big deal. And I would much rather someone was able to figure out what this equation is, and maybe they do miss a half or a numerical factor, then they've just memorized it. Because memorizing, it's really not going to help you so much with your problem solving. So we can be confident that that is our equation. And now we're ready to start putting the numbers in. We can start crunching the numbers. The key thing is when we put the numbers in, don't just reach straight for your calculator. Put the numbers in with the units. So when you write it out, it's going to look something like this. Now, it might look a bit kind of long. It's just because I'm writing out all the units. Now, don't be tempted to just put the numbers in without the units, because then you won't be able to check what's going on. So we've got, you know, our heat capacity has got joules per kilogram per Kelvin. So only at this point do you want to be reaching for your calculator and start crunching the numbers, OK? So once we get here, we can crunch the numbers. And we also want to check that the units are going to come out as we expect. So if you look at the units, we've got joules per kilogram per Kelvin, and we're multiplying by kilograms, and we're multiplying by Kelvin. So when we crunch the numbers, we'll get some value for the energy. But crucially, it's going to have units of joules. So 3,000 and something uh, joules, 3 point something kilojoules. So even if we can't remember what the equation is, by writing everything down with the symbols and the units, thinking about what the equation has to be, keeping the units in there, we can be very confident that we really do have the right answer. And, you know, worst case, you know, maybe we've missed a factor of pi or a factor of two, something which isn't going to change the units. But if you can do this in an exam, that's just a really fantastic ability to have, okay? And I'd much rather someone's able to do that than they've just memorized all the equations at the back of the textbook, okay? That's really not going to help you so much for the rest of your degree. This is going to be a much more kind of general approach to problem solving. Does anyone have any questions about that? Anything they want to ask? So if you, oh yeah, I've got a question over here. Oh, great question. So the question is, how can you practice that? So um, I'd say the way to practice anything is by making sure you're, you're working this through every time. So you get in the habit. Um, so really great, great question. I'm glad you asked. So whenever you're solving a question, you might think, OK, well, this is maybe a kind of easy looking question. I can pretty much just put the numbers straight in my calculator. I don't even need to write anything out. Get in the habit, even if you, you think it's going to be an easy question, of starting by just taking this inventory of everything you have, so with the symbols and the units. And I think especially the, the step that I kind of see people miss out most often is when you get to this step, what I see most often is that people just miss out the units at that step and they just write in the numbers. So always at that step, it may seem like a bit more writing, but if you just always get in the habit of always writing values out with the units, what that's going to mean is when you do come to a question and you can't remember the equation or you can't see straight away how to solve it, all of this problem solving stuff, it's just going to be in a bit of muscle memory. It's just going to be habit. So my suggestion is, great question. I'm glad you asked. The way to practice this is by doing it absolutely every single time in all the questions that you're working on. Really, really good question there. Does anybody else want to ask anything about this for now? So if you do have any other questions about this, 
this is a great kind of thing. We can go over at the um, drop in help session right afterwards. So I think let's move on to the main subject for this week. So we're thinking about pressure and stress and strain this week. Now, I always like to start with some image which has some connection to what we're looking at. Um, and this week, I thought there was one image which really kind of encapsulated all of the concepts we're going to be thinking about this week, just in one absolutely fantastic experiment. So I actually mentioned this um, way back in lecture zero at the start of the semester. So back when I was a student, um, I spent a summer working on this fantastic experiment in the US. So this experiment here, it's in Livingston, Louisiana. Does anybody remember that from lecture zero or maybe you've seen this before somewhere else? Who, who remembers this from the, the thing? Do you guys remember what this is called, what it's all about? Does anybody else remember what, it, what it's called, what it's all about? So what this experiment here is, it's an absolutely huge physics experiment. So that um, arm you can see going off there, that's four kilometers long. And there's another arm going off in this direction, also four kilometers long. This particular experiment is in Livingston, Louisiana. There's another identical experiment in Washington State in the US. And there's another very similar experiment in Italy. And they all work as a network. So this experiment is called a gravitational wave detector. Has anybody heard of gravitational waves before? OK, a few people, a few people. OK, so this is one of the most absolute exciting physics discoveries of recent years. They were only detected just a few years ago. Um, for the very first time. So these are, uh, they're described as ripples in the fabric of space-time. And that might sound quite esoteric, but that really is what they are. So whenever you have a very violent astrophysical event, like two black holes merging, something like that, it, they really do create ripples in space-time, which travel through the cosmos. And whenever they reach anything, they cause very, very tiny changes in the lengths of things. And it's those very tiny lengths which this experiment is designed to detect. So the idea is that when a gravitational wave passes by this experiment, it very slightly changes the length of one of these arms and changes the length of the other arm in the opposite way. And that change in length um, fundamentally is what we call strain. So um, the amount that length is being changed. So this huge experiment um, is all built to detect uh, strain, uh, what we call the strain of a gravitational wave. So we're going to be finding out exactly what strain is. In order to do this, these giant arms here, they've got two uh, laser beams going down the arms there. And in a few weeks, we're going to learn a bit about the properties of wave interference that you use in an experiment like this to detect gravitational waves. But in order to do this, these huge arms here, they have to be pumped down to very, very low pressure. So this is an extraordinarily low vacuum, an ultra high vacuum, because if there was any air in any of these tubes, it would really interfere with the experiment. So these gravitational wave detectors are some of the largest vacuums in Earth's atmosphere. So I thought this picture, it's a great example, not just of strain, but also of pressure. So the last picture I'll show you guys about this. If we look in this kind of main building there, that's where all of the equipment is. That's where the laser beams start. That's where the, the pressure uh, equipment is kept. Um, so it looks something like uh, this. This is actually from the uh, detector in Washington State, but they, they look basically the same. So this is really the heart of the experiment. That uh, kind of corner over there, that's the heart where these two arms are. And then we've got these two arms, they go off four kilometers in either way. And these silver tubes here, that's where the vacuum is kept. So it's pumped down to ultra high vacuum, critical to uh, keep the whole experiment working. And it's that ultra low pressure which makes it possible to detect gravitational waves. So I thought that's a kind of nice 
the kind of context uh, for this week to be thinking about pressure and stress and strain. So let's start by uh, thinking about uh, pressure as a concept. So some of you have done pressure before, so this is going to be kind of easy. So I've got a question for you guys here. So what does pressure mean when we are thinking about uh, physics? So I'll get the question going. Let's see what everybody thinks for this one. So pressure, it's one of these things we use in everyday language. Of course, in physics, it's got this specific meaning. So let's see what everybody thinks for the meaning of pressure. OK, let's see what everybody thinks for the uh, definition of pressure when we're talking about physics. What do we get? OK, so looks like most people are going for C. Now, um, what does any, everybody remember? Can I remember what, what is option B there, that force through a distance? Can I remember that one? Oh, yeah. Work done. Very good. OK, so remember, force times a distance, that's work done. So we can eliminate that one even if we're not sure. Now, what about option D? This one's a bit interesting. Can, I remember, can anyone see what option D is? Power per area. So this is an interesting one, OK? Maybe I'll leave that one for you guys to think about. But I think as most people uh, got, so pressure, it's force per area. So option C there. So very well done, everybody who gave that a go. Now, if that seems a bit, um, I, I, I don't know, conceptual, um, the way I always like to think about it, um, let me draw a little diagram over here. So I always like to think about maybe I've got some area like this. So I've got some so I've got some area, so you know it might be a meter squared, it might be a square inch, whatever you like. We've got some area. And then we've got some force. So a big old arrow representing a force. So that's kind of how I like to think of it. It's some force per area. So whatever the force is, whatever the area is, we can use that to calculate what our pressure is. So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go. Really good to see most people were kind of spotting what uh, pressure is. Now, especially after the introduction to this lecture, I'm sure it's going to come as no surprise that we're going to be thinking about the units for pressure. So let's try this question. Which one of these is the SI units? For pressure. Now what's interesting about this one is that these are all units of pressure but only one of them is the SI unit for pressure. Okay very good to see those responses coming in. Let's see what everybody thinks. Which one of these is the SI units for pressure? Okay so it looks like most people are going for B. Does anybody know what option A, what does that PSI stand for? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, very good. Pounds per square inch. So that is a unit of force. We have a pound of force per square inch. So that is a force per area, but that's not um, SI units. Um, now, in just a moment, we're going to see what all of these units of pressure are, but it looks like most people got correctly the units for pressure, they're Pascal. So those are the SI units for pressure. So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go. Now, Pascal's. They're not one of our SI base units, you know, like time or distance. We say Pascals, you know, they're a derived unit because it's composed of, we've got a force per area. So let's think about what one Pascal of force is in terms of our SI base units. So we know that pressure is force per area. So what we need to think really is, what is force in terms of our SI base units? So it might be helpful to think about how we define a force. Once we've got the force in terms of base units, then we can figure out what the units of pressure are in terms of our base units. OK, very good to see all those responses coming in. Let's see what everybody thinks. Uh, what are the units of pressure in terms of our base units? OK, so a bit more 
kind of evenly spread out there. Some people going for A, some people going for B, most people going for C, some people going for D. Now, I think the thing to kind of really help you with this question to get started It's always very useful to start by thinking what the units of force are. Now, how can we go about figuring out the units of force if we can't remember them? Any ideas about where we could start with that? Oh, yeah. Fantastic. We can use F equals MA. OK, really good. Great place to start. Now, I'm sure by the end of the semester, no one's going to need to memorize F equals MA. You're going to forget your own name and where you live before you forget that F equals MA. So we can start by writing down our force is equal to mass times acceleration. And this is a great place to start. This is really going to be all we need to figure out the question. So then we can say, well, the units of force, well, it's just whatever the units of mass times acceleration are. So mass, the units of that are kilograms. And then acceleration, that's meters per second squared. So meters per second squared. So that's a kind of great place to start units of force because forces, they come up all the time, even if we're not thinking about the units for pressure. Almost anything we think about in physics, it's going to depend on a force. So if you can um, build up for yourself the units of force in terms of base units, that's going to be really handy for you. So once we've got that, so then we know pressure, it's force per area. Area is meters squared. So when we divide the meters by meters squared, we get per meter. So we get option C there. So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go, because the important thing with these questions, more important than uh, getting the exact thing right, is engaging with them and giving it a go. And even if you don't get the question right, Remember, that's always a kind of great opportunity to pick something up that's going to be useful for you. So don't worry too much if you don't get the questions right. You know, really, that's kind of, uh, you know, when the time starts to, um, you know, pick up something that, you know, maybe you're going to cut to the exam and that could be just the thing that you need. And you're going to remember it because it came up in the question there. So that's how we can figure out what the units of pressure are in terms of our base units. So let's now try, in this question, let's try um, a bit more of a kind of quantitative one, try crunching some numbers there. So maybe we've got a situation, we've taken our car in for a service, you know, we know the mass of the car, and we're going to have our car raised up on some hydraulic. Now, you guys know what I'm talking about, maybe you're getting your, you know, the, the tyres serviced. So what we want to think about, if we know the diameter of that hydraulic jack, how much pressure do we need? How much hydraulic pressure do we need in that fluid in order to keep our car raised up? So I'll get this question going. Let's see what everybody thinks for this one. So there's two pieces to this puzzle. Pressure is force per area. So we need to figure out what the force is due to the mass of the car. And we need to think about the area that the car's being suspended on. So there's two pieces of the puzzle that we need to figure out and then combine them and we can work out what our pressure is. Okay, very good everyone. Very good to see everybody crunching the numbers on this one. There's a few more steps to it. Let's see what everybody gets for this one. Okay, so looks like most people are going for C, but some people are going for all of them. So the one thing to start with on this, so um, one pascal of pressure, so that's one newton of force per meter squared, that's not really much pressure at all. So it's quite often useful to use this thing called one bar of pressure, so uh, one bar is equal to 100,000 pascals. So that just makes our life a bit easier um, for measuring kind of everyday kind of pressures in bar instead of pascal. Um, now when we come to calculate the area, why do we have the size of our hydraulic um, support? Why do we have the diameter of that when it's the radius that we actually want? Does anyone have any ideas about that? Why not just have the radius? 
So this is all to do with what we can actually measure. So if you are ever in a lab and you want to measure the area of, say, a, the, you know, the top of a cylinder, you can't directly measure the radius. What you directly measure is the diameter. So whenever we're just thinking about how to do you know, experiments in real life, it does help to just think about, well, what could we actually measure and what do we need to calculate? So you've got to just convert the diameter to the radius there. So when you calculate the area of the cylinder and then the force due to the force of gravity of the car, you put them together so you get the 17.4 bar of pressure. So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go. If you're not too sure about this one, we can certainly go through this one at the drop-in workshop right after the lecture. So the last couple of slides for today, I'd just like to take a bit of a look about some different pressures and maybe some pressures in LIGO. And we can do stress and strain next time. So let's just take a look at some other um, pressures that you might commonly see. So I've got a nice example of a pressure gauge. So if you look at the scale there, on the inside, the scale is given in bar. So you can see where our pressure of, you know, 17 something bar would be on that. And then on the outside, we've also got the pressure in PSI. Where, where are all the engineers today? Where, where's all the engineers sitting? Okay, so especially if you're in engineering, engineers quite commonly use PSI as a unit of pressure, especially if you're engineering anything uh, that's going to be used in America, they're still fond of PSI. So even though it's not an SI unit, it does help to be a bit familiar with PSI and some other units of pressure. Now, a good place to start with other pressures is atmospheric pressure. So the pressure of our atmosphere, kind of day-to-day -day life, it's about 101,000 pascals. So remember, a pascal, not a very big unit of pressure. So atmospheric pressure, quite a lot of pascals. And because the pr atmospheric pressure just happens to come out as quite close to 100,000, that's why it's useful to define this one bar of pressure. So as 100,000 pascals. So you can see from that, so atmospheric pressure, it's about one bar. And of course, the particular pressure in the atmosphere, it's going to vary on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. Maybe some days we're going to have higher pressure, some days we're going to have lower pressure. If you go up somewhere really high, somewhere high altitude, we're going to have lower pressure there as well. So a few other kind of units of pressure. So uh, PSI pounds per square inch. So pound is a unit of force, square inch, unit of area. So pounds per square inch, unit of force. So especially if you're in engineering, if you're working with cars, very commonly use pressure for car tires, that kind of thing. And then last pressure for today. So you might also see one tor of pressure, which is a fraction of atmospheric pressure. So it's just good to have a bit of idea of some of the other pressures that you might see when you're out in the wild dealing with some pressures. So I think the last slide for today that we'll wrap things up on, just to finish with this picture of the gravitational wave detector there. So those two arms at 90 degrees to each other, these are very highly, uh, very high, ultra high vacuum tubes so we can do the whole experiment. So the pressure there, it's about 10 to the minus seven pascals, four times 10 to the minus seven pascals. So very, very low pressure. And in terms of atmospheric pressure, that's about 10 to the minus 13 times atmospheric pressure. So far, far lower than atmospheric pressure. And it's very, very unusual, in fact, unprecedented, to have such an ultra high vacuum for such a large uh, experiment that goes on for kilometers. Okay, so really is an extraordinarily low pressure. And the whole reason this experiment is run at such low pressure is because it's all about measuring very, very tiny changes in the length of these arms, which is what we call the strain. So I think that's a good point to wrap things up for today, and then we're ready to start things next time thinking about stress and strain. So excellent work today with all those questions. If you want to go through anything at the drop-in help session, that's great. Otherwise, I'll see you all on Thursday.